Hey, I am Philip Monk uh, on Urban. I'm with Dev Wisfright. Um, and I wanted to do a walkthrough of the code for naive rollups. Um, I'm not going to go into a lot of background here. Um, uh, naive rollups theoretically, or why why it why we think it's a good idea. Um, we being you know, myself and Flan, uh, but we intend to propose these relatively soon um, as a way to make Urban ID transactions uh, much cheaper. Everyone, I think, is familiar with uh, how Ethereum transactions are are expensive right now. It, it's maybe I don't know fifty dollars or so to transfer a planet uh, if you're yeah, if you pay a lot of attention to you know to the gas price and how exactly you're doing it, you might be able to do it for that price, um, and that's uh, that's way more than what we want. Um, and so this should be able to reduce that price by quite a bit. Um, and so I just wanted to go through the code basically line by line um, and describe the exact semantics so that everyone. To well to to try and propagate uh, an understanding of what of what the uh, the rules are for for urban IDs, um, you know how they're transferred and what what exactly they are like just a a top to bottom. This is everything that can be done. Um, this is in part because the galaxies will vote on whether to adopt this layer two solution. Um, and so we want to make sure that uh, that all the galaxy holders understand this, but also it's important for the rest of the community to understand um, what's happening here and to uh, give feedback uh, before the vote. Um, there's, you know, the, this stuff can still be changed, definitely. Um, it can be changed afterwards as well, um, but that would require another vote. Um, so... We'll try and get get right to it. This is going to be a technical explanation. We're just going to be we're just going to be looking through the code basically. Um, but to set the technical context, um, the azimuth state, azimuth is urban ID, um, will be represented as a noun because this is urban. Everything is nouns. Um, and that state is a pure function of an event log, like many other things in Urbit. Um, this event log, which I'll call a transaction list, just because uh, the terms, both the terms event and log, have specific meanings, more or less the same meaning. Um, but in um, Ethereum, uh, and it's not quite what I mean here. So, um, but there is a list of transactions that that you can, you know, roll up into a state. So um, there's two kinds of transactions. They come from Ethereum in two different ways. One is the existing layer one contracts, the solidity contracts. Um, those are going to continue to function in the same way that they do now. Um, and upon release, the uh, all the ships will be on layer one. And you'll control them with normal layer one transactions. Uh, when when you send a layer one transaction, Solidity produces what are called logs or events, um, which say what happened. So, for example, if you transfer a ship from A to B, then there will be a uh, then it'll it'll emit a log that says transfer from A to B. And so, um, as the as a mistake, obviously needs to react to that by updating the ownership address for that ship. Um, the second kind of transaction is the new ones, and these are what we call layer two transactions, um, which are sent from. Uh, so they're they're sent 
in batches on layer one, just as data. And layer one doesn't do anything with them. There's no solidity to interpret them um, or to validate them, them in any way. They're just sent to a dummy contract. And then when an Urbit node sees that that was sent, it, um, it downloads those transactions and then runs them through this function. And so between these two types of events, we have a complete description of what the ISM state is. Since it's on a blockchain, there's, uh, you know, we have consensus as to what that state actually is. Um, and since they're both on you know, the, the, the same blockchain, there's actually, there, this is a totally ordered list, right? Because uh, the blocks are totally ordered. And then within each block, there's a list of transactions, which is also ordered. Um, so there's no confusion as to if you have two conflicting transactions, which one counts first. It's just the first one counts first. Um, so this is a pretty standard setup. The interesting part is the pure function, um, which is naive dot hoon. It's the, the state transition function, the lifecycle function. There's, you can call it any number of things. Um, and so that's what we're going to go through today. Um, when you're defining a function like this, it's extremely important that everyone gets the same answer. Everyone runs this code, gets the same answer, understands what's happening, um, because that's how you make sure that everyone agrees on who owns what ship. Um, and so you need it to be de the code to be deterministic um, and precisely defined. Uh, knock fits that bill well. Its definition is very small. Fits on a t-shirt. We we use it extensively. Um, and then to build up to this, what you need is some functions from the standard library and then the actual code here. Um, and so we decided not to include the entire standard library because the entire standard library is, is large, it's maybe 20,000-ish lines of code. Um, and you know, surely there are bugs in there, probably not ones that would make a difference, but in any you know 20,000 lines of code, you're likely to have some bugs here or there. Um, and that's not something that you want in, uh, you know, a, a small precise definition of a state transition function. And so we define a small standard library um, uh, which just realized I meant to rename to tiny because, yeah, it's fewer syllables than std and more evocative. If you say std, no one knows what you're talking about. But if you say tiny, they're like, they're like you know what it means. If you say lib tiny, they're like, oh, okay, I know what that is. Um, right, so we include that small standard library, and then the rest of it's defined here. The That file is like 700 lines-ish, and this is 900, so about uh, 1,600, uh, no more than 1,700 lines of code total, uh, plus, I guess, well, 15 lines or whatever for the knock spec. Um, all of that combined is, is a complete semantic specification. Um, that's a similar number of lines of code as the solidity contracts, but solidity contracts, of course, rely on the entire definition of the EVM, which is a lot more lines of code. Um, so in some kind of absolute sense, this is a simpler uh, system than the Solidity one. Um, right, so this is a function on an event 
log. Uh, we do it one, one transaction at a time. So you start with a blank state, and then you say, okay, here's a function from the old state and input to a list of effects and new state. Um, the effects are um, so the new state is is this now that, we, that we've been talking about just updates to, to that state. We also anytime we change something, we emit a specific effect. Um, this is just like the layer one logs I was talking about before, where it's like um, you know it, it was a transfer of this ship from. A to B. Um, and the reason you do this is so that um, anyone listening to this can quickly tell what changed without having to like run a manual diff on the old state with the new state or something like that. Um, makes it much easier for stuff to interact with this and build uh, secondary indexes on top of on top of this. Anyways, that's enough introduction. Um, the the, the the function has basically these five parts. Starts with the standard library we talked about, um, defines some constants, defines some types, and then you know handles layer one transactions, those logs, handles layer two transactions, this is to parse the batches and then handle them, um, and that's about it. And we're going to go through this top to bottom. Um, shouldn't take too long. Uh, the only part that we won't go through quite line by line um, is um, the, uh, the the tiny library, um, but we will go through it in like we will at least glance at it. So we uh, the first thing we do here is we get rid of the subject. So Tisgar with this constant says, forget about the standard library that this is compiled against, just get rid of it, don't include it in the result, um, and set our subject to this constant. That constant is, the only way that it's special is that the runtime recognizes that constant as a root for matching jets, um, because we need to jet various things in this, in this standard library. Um, this is also jet matching stuff. And then we define types, and these are all copied verbatim from um, from hoon.hoon. Uh, I might have reformatted some of them slightly, but that's it. You know, we define things like ship and life and rift. Um, all of these are pretty standard. Octs we'll see a lot. That's um, that's a pair of an, an atom and the number of bytes in that atom. So let's you do fixed width uh, operations, which is useful. Or maybe not, not as much fixed width as explicit width operations. Um, you'll notice we define lists, we define trees, we define maps, sets, jugs. Um, hopefully you're familiar with these. Uh, you may not be familiar with a jug, it's just a map of a key to a set of values, um, which is just a useful data structure. So instead of map of key to values, map of key to set of value. Um, then we have various bit twiddling. Get rid of this, so we see the comments. We decrement, we add, subtract, I mean, this is this is literally starting with just knock, so we do have to define things like decrement. Um, yeah, we add, subtract, multiply, divide, uh, modulo, binary exponent, so that's just uh, two to the x, which is left shift, um, or something close to it. This one's the actual left shift, right shift, uh, binary and an or, um, xor. Comparing you know, less than, greater than, um, uh, this reverses endianness. Uh, although I'm not sure we actually use that. I should check into that. But um, measures how how long an atom is. 
uh, cuts off one side of, of an atom, it's concatenates two atoms together, gets a slice out of an atom, uh, more concatenations of various sorts. In, in particular, there's concatenations of, um, of octs, essentially, or not necessarily, well, yeah. Um, so con concatenations with explicit width, uh, which is useful to avoid issues where you have um, leading zeros. The danger of using MET is always, uh, to, to measure the size of an atom, is that uh, if you have leading zeros, it looks smaller than you expect it to be. So we do a lot of stuff with explicit widths. Um, these are all the same kind, kind of thing. And then we have a series of list-related functions, find its length, take an item out of the middle, um, concatenate them, turn, that's, that's the map. Um, then we uh, are going to have maps and sets, and those are, for us, they're treeps which require a hash function. Mug is a hash function that we use in a lot of places. It's a 31-bit hash, so not, not a secure hash, um, but, it, uh, but it's fast, and uh, that's all you need for, for a treep, because the only reason that you need the... the hash is to keep it balanced. You don't worry about uh, collisions or anything like that. So there's a bit of modular arithmetic to define that hash. It's um, murmur three is what it is on um, atoms. And then we just extend that to cells with, uh, with this code basically. So that produces the mug hash. Uh, a couple more comparisons. This is the yeah, mug-based ordering. You need those for treeps. Um, this is another ordering one that is actually not for, well, yeah, so the, the, this one is not mug-based, is what, is what it is. Um, it is um, parent order. So it, it's meant for use on ships. It keeps um, children next to their parents in order. So Marzad is a child of Zod, um, and Marbus is a child of Bus, and Marfep is a child of Fep. And so if you, if you order, if you put those in order, the order will be Zod, Marzad, Bus, Marbus, Fep, Marfep. Um, Wicked Wistrite is a child of Marzod, so that'd be Zod, Marzod, Wicked Wistrite, and then Bus, and so on. Um, and so that's a useful ordering that uh, that we'll see later on. Then we have the standard uh, map definition, just the functions we need. Uh, you know, get get an item out of the map, check whether it's in the map, put an item in the map, delete an item from the map, um, make sure that it's uh, incorrect mug order. We also have an ordered map, which is uh, you give it a comparator function. In for for us, we're going to use that parent ordering function, um, and it will use mug order for the vertical ordering. But for the horizontal ordering, it will use the comparator function, which makes it efficient to take subsets. Uh, so for example, using the parent ordering, if you wanted to get a subset from, you know, of all the children of Zod, you could do um, uh, just, you know, a, a subset from Zod to neck or to um, Fipzod, which I would prefer. To, I don't remember if we do the subset uh, inclusive or exclusive. Um, and it'll it'll get all those. Um, yeah. But it has the same functions as normal map, pretty much, as get. It has, has um, it has lot, which is the um, which I think is the 
a subset function, and I we don't use it in naive.hune, so it should be gotten it should be deleted from here, I think, and just used in um, in any code that has um, uh, like that's building indices on top of this. All right, um, we define sets. This is similar. Define jugs, and that's the that's all of the standard library that we need. We don't need anything with strings. We don't need anything with parsers, or certainly don't need the compiler. No virtualization. Just some bit twiddling, some data, uh, and then a few standard data structures. All right, then let's go on to naive.hun itself. So um, this is saying basically import that library and then set our subject to be that library. So again, to get rid of the full standard library and only use this tiny. Um, for debugging, we have a laconic bit, which is uh, just the, it's the reverse of a verbosity bit. Um, and uh, it has no semantic effect. It just depends. It just, um, you can, if you unset it, then uh, it'll print debug messages. All right, so we define some constants. First one, important one, is the deposit address. So when we're depositing uh, ships from layer one to layer two, we we really just need a way to mark those on layer one as having been sent to layer two. They need to be burned basically on, on layer one. Um, and so the way that we represent that is we say, okay, transfer it to this particular address. Um, and it could be any address as long as it's recognizable. We chose this one because uh, you actually can't send ships to the zero address uh, because the, uh, the solidity disallows it. Um, and the ones are recognizable. I mean, uh, it could have been, it could have been anything as long as it's something recognizable. Um, and so any any ships sent to this address, we're going to interpret that as depositing here. Um, and then we have a series of hashes that were generated with this code. Um, and these represent the layer one logs that, that we talked about before. Um, this is how we'll, we will recognize which log uh, means what. We'll just check against these these uh, these hashes. Those are all the constants. Now we're going to define some types. Um, the most important type is going to be state type. Um, we'll start there. So this is the state of azimuth. It has three things in it. One is is points, which is going to be the actual uh, tree of of ship names and point data. So that's the main azimuth data. Uh, but before we look at that, I'll just briefly mention the other two items here. Operators is a jug from address to address, which means it's a map of address to set to set of address. Um, this is uh, has no layer two effect, but on layer one. There's a concept of operators, which is uh, addresses that you've designated to be able to control any assets that you own. Um, so the 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 key here is is an address that owns some ships, and then you can add addresses as operators, and those can then control any of your ships. Uh, this is meant for use on layer one to you, you would add smart contracts as operators generally. Um, 
and so that they can, you know, you, you could add, for example, a decentralized exchange, and then that, uh, you know, the, you, you can look at that smart contract code and see that it's not going to just take your 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 tokens. All it's going to do is uh, take them if a trade went through where you signed a trade offer and someone else accepted it. Um, anyways, so that's something that's useful when you have smart contracts, um, but we don't have generic smart contracts on layer two. Um, and so to reduce complexity, we don't support handling operators on layer two. Um, however, since they exist on layer one, we reflect that information here um, because all of the information should be should be here in this now. Uh, DNS is a list of domain names to look for uh, to look for galaxies. So when you get on the urban network, um, to be able to find anyone else, you need to uh, start by finding their galaxy, and so that needs to be bootstrapped somehow. Uh, now, like how to find a galaxy, and right now. The way we do that is that Azimuth maintains this list of uh, of addresses in the Solidity. It's it's actually just explicitly there. There are three addresses, and they're currently all set to urban.org. Um, and so that means if you're looking for Zod, you look at zod.urban.org. If you're looking for NEC, you look at neck.urban.org, um, and that gives the IP address. Then you can you can ping them on uh, on a well-known port. And then now you can start talking to the rest of the network. Um, I think this should be changed at some point. I think that basically each galaxy should be able to broadcast their own IP address here um, or their own domain name or you know, maybe other ways of, of, of uh, possibly even like multiple ways of, of, of finding them. Um, but this is how it's done on, on layer one right now. And so uh, I've tried to follow the principle that in it, so, so much as we can, we should avoid changing uh, the semantics because we want to make kind of separate policy decisions, right? We want this decision to be, we're gonna support layer two. And later on we can we can ask, okay, we want to support a richer, uh, you know, bootstrapping system, a richer DNS system, a richer whatever. Um, but that's something that shouldn't be sort of bundled into this omnibus, you know, must pass urgent bill. It's just like, no, um, we're going to make one change and try to avoid changing the semantics as much as possible. So that's what these are points, which is the main data, is a tree, so it's, it's an ordered map, uh, where the key is the ship name, and the value is a point. Point is this, so it's a tuple. First item is dominion. Dominion is where is where the ship is on, right? In the beginning, every ship is on layer one. Um, when they get deposited to layer two, then they're then they're layer then, then the dominion is layer two. If they are still in layer one, but they have deposited their spawn proxy to layer two, then their dominion is spawn. The other items here are um, should be familiar from layer one, which is that each each ship has an owner address, a spawn proxy. A management proxy, a voting proxy, and a transfer proxy. And they each have various rights. The owner has all rights. Um, each of these is an address, which is just an Ethereum address. Uh, any normal Ethereum wallet should work. Um, it can't be a contract. It can't be like a multi-sig contract because uh, it's going to have to be able to sign something. So it needs to be a, I forget what they call it, an EOA. I forget what that stands for. But it, it, it needs to be, a, you know, an address that's not a contract that actually has private keys. Um, 
but it, it, you can own something with the same keys, you know, with the server, same, uh, you know, same ledger, same MetaMask account, same Urbit HD wallet uh, on layer one and layer two at the same time. No, there's no problem. Um, each of these includes a nonce as well um, to avoid replay attacks. Basically, when you send a transaction, uh, say your transaction is, uh, I'm going to set my management proxy to address A. Um, and then because management proxy is not that valuable, you don't take good care of it. Someone steals address A. And so you're like, oh, well, that's okay. I'm, I'm still the owner, so I'll just switch the management address to address B. Um, the attacker could go find your old transaction saying set the management proxy to address A um, and just send that again. And then now the, the address, the management proxy would be A again, and now they can breach your ship or, you know, anything that a management proxy can do. Um, and so the solution to this, which is standard used in pretty much anything, any system that has, um, that has accounts, like Ethereum, for example, um, is to have a nonce for each address, um, which is just a number starting at zero, and every transaction you send from that address, you, you increment the nonce by one. Uh, the biggest difference here between our nonces and Ethereum's nonces is on Ethereum, the nonces are per, or are actually per address, like I've been saying. For us, they're per ship and roll, ship and proxy. So um, if you change your owner address, that doesn't reset the nonce. And if you have a, uh, an address that owns several ships, it has a different nonce for each of those ships. The mindset here is that your ID, in Ethereum, your ID is an address that corresponds to a single private key. Here, your ID is your Urbit ID. And in, so instead of saying this Ethereum address owns all these ships, you say this ship is owned by this Ethereum address. But the subject is the ship. Um, and so what that means is um, is that we don't have to keep any state about addresses, particularly. We keep state about ships. And that's where, and that's where the nonces end up. Um, for anyone who's, uh, who sees the immediate problem with that, uh, which would be that you, uh, you could take the same transaction and apply it to several different ships, uh, that doesn't work because when we send a transaction, you end up, you, you specify who you're sending it as, like which ship you're sending it as. And so that's in the signature. And so, uh, you can't replay across ships because of that. Okay. So much for, uh, the ownership stuff, the solidity calls the section rights. Um, and then there's these which are the um so these have to do with like with urban id basically and these have to do with urban os um this is sort of the whole point of azimuth is to convey this information rift is the uh your continuity number so every time you breach that it gets incremented keys is your um authentication key and encryption key the crypto suite version number which would change if we uh, changed encryption algorithms, um, which presumably we'll have to do at some point because they, you know, they, encryption algorithms expire. Um, and then your life, of course, is the uh, the number of times that you've that you've uh, revised these keys. Uh, these are the networking keys that you use on the Urban Network to talk to other people.
the other things that we have in Urban ID is we have a concept of a sponsor, um, which is used for a few things. Sometimes just as a default, sometimes, uh, uh, sometimes not, there may not be a way to override that default, at least not yet. Um, we, so you can have a ship as a sponsor. You can also, so this is, uh, the way this is laid out is that you either have a sponsor or you don't. Um, and if you do, then this is who it is. Um, the, if you wanted to, so if you want to change sponsors, then you can start trying to escape. Um, when you do that, this gets filled in. And then you'd be in a situation where it's like, I have a sponsor, it is so-and-so, but I want it to be this other person. Um, and then they can accept it or not, but you still have the old sponsor until then. Um, the only way that you can lose a sponsor is if your current sponsor uh, disavows you. Um, and then you would not have a sponsor, and then you should try to escape someone else. Um, the reason that this is not a unit, Pat P, is um, technically, the, if you remove, I'm trying to remember the details, it, it, it would be slightly different semantics if you had unit Pat P. Um, I, I, I forget the case right now. Um, And at the least, it's confusing enough to try to figure out the state transitions that um, I, I believe that it is worth it to just duplicate what's in the solidity. So this is how it's laid out exactly in the solidity. And so I duplicate the state transitions exactly so that we can, uh, especially because you, you can have complicated situations where the, you know, the sponsors on layer one but the sponsee is on layer two, or the sponsee is on layer one, but the sponsor is on layer two. Um, and so keeping the same data structure on both sides uh, helps reduce some of that complexity. And so that's where we're at. And that's the, that's an, an that's a complete definition of our, of our state. Um, The other types here, um, we'll go through transactions and, and, and diffs, which are, which are effects. Um, so a transaction is a, uh, it's a from address, which is like going to be a ship name and a proxy. Proxy is, um, There, uh, it's either the ownership or one of the proxies. We call it proxy, but it could be the ownership address. It's just specifying which one we're claiming to be, um, or rather, which one, yeah, which one we're acting as. Um, and um, and then there's the actual content of the transaction, which is this union. So there are eleven types of transactions, which we'll go through uh, when we handle them, but uh, we'll also go through them briefly now. You can transfer a ship. Um, you, uh, the ship that gets transferred is the from ship, um, and it'll be transferred to this address. Reset is something that exists in the solidity and is a flag to say that I want to reset all the, um, the proxies and breach the ship in the act of transferring. Um, which you would generally do if you're transferring to someone other than yourself. Uh, but if you're just transferring from your one wallet to another wallet of your own, then you would not want to do that. So you set reset to false. Um, second thing you can do is you can spawn ships. So as the parent, you would spawn a new ship to a particular address. Um, another thing you can do is configure keys. So that's how you, how you would cycle your keys. You supply the new encryption key, authentication key, 
for the suite. Uh, and then you say whether or not you want to breach. Uh, you can escape to a, to a new parent, or you know, at least, or which is just to uh, begin the process of escaping. They would need to accept you. You can cancel uh, an escape that you're trying to do as uh, as the child. Um, as the parent, you can adopt. Uh, so if someone is trying to escape to you, then you can accept it. Basically, you can reject it. You can, um, anyone that you're currently sponsoring, you can detach uh, if you no longer want to um, sponsor them. And then the last three is you can set your management proxy, you spawn proxy, and you transfer proxy. You'll notice there's no voting proxy here. Um, that's because voting is not implemented on layer two. Um, galaxies must remain on layer one for now. Um, until because they need to be able to vote, and so until we decide that we want to move voting to layer two, um, they have to stay on layer one. There's no point in having a voting proxy here, so we'll add that if if and when we need it. So that's what a transaction looks like. Um, it's got that content. It's got the the from address. Um, in practice, it's going to end up being uh, being paired with a signature, um, which hopefully comes from that, from the address at the nonce for that shipping proxy. All right, we've gone through most of these. We'll look at diff real quick. So diff is the effects that we talked about here. Um, So whenever we make a state change, we want to tell whoever's running this what happened so they can update their indexes. Um, anytime a transaction comes through, uh, if the signature passes and the nonce check passes, then we update the nonce. So we, that's one of the, of the effects that can happen. Another is um, a, tra a transaction either succeeded or failed. Um, if it failed, we, we can give an error message. Um, this is useful for, for like an aggregator. It's trying to see, you know, I sent a transaction. Did it, uh, did it ever get interpreted? Um, operator that just says that, that we added or removed an operator. DNS means we changed the, the list of DNS domains. And then um, for any particular ship, point is a, is a term of art for ship, specifically in the context of, of azimuth, of Herbert ID. Um, so a ship can be modified in any of these ways. It could have breached, it could have changed its keys, it could have changed its sponsor, it could uh, be gaining be beginning to or ending escaping. Like the escape could be beginning or ending. Um, could have a new owner address or a new, any of the proxies could have changed its dominion. Uh, so it could have been deposited to layer two, essentially. Um, and so everything's gonna produce a list of, a list of these diffs. All right. Um, we have covered each of these except ORM. ORM is the ordered map for um, uh, for the points. So that tree is, uh, is an ordered map from ship to point, as we described, and it uses the parent ordering, as we described before. And then we've been through these types. Um, operators proxy role is a term we use for uh, what I've been also calling batch, um, so a roll of transactions uh, will come in and then we'll usually price each one. We talked about raw TX, well we, we said that, that there's transactions that come with signature. The uh, In this type we also keep the raw, um, like the pre-parsed version. Um, 
just so that we can check the signature later on. Um, and then the last thing, the last type we have, well, the last couple types we have is our input. So we said there's two kinds of input. There's layer one transactions, and there's layer two transactions. Layer one transactions come individually as an event log. Event log is from a particular address. It's got data, which we're, we're gonna parse out. The, the data will say like, this was a transfer of such and such ship from A to B, um, and it has topics. So the, the, the combination of data and topics will, will tell us what happened. Um, a list is a list that's guaranteed to be at least, to have at least one element. Um, so that's the layer one transactions. We also get layer two transactions, which is a batch. Batch is coming just as an atom. Um, and then we parse out from there. Um, the last type here is um, a signature verifier. So verifying signatures is both relatively complicated, not too bad, but still relatively complicated and not something that, so it's, it's, it's okay. So it's relatively complicated. It's precisely defined elsewhere um, to the point where we actually don't want to define it directly in here because it would not actually be authoritative. What's in here should be authoritative. If we wrote out a signature checker in Hoon and it had a bug in it, it was different than the regular ECDSA signature checker, then uh, we wouldn't want to use the one with the bug, we'd want to use the real one. And so, what we say as as our spec is that this is actually a function from you know a, a verifier function that you pass in plus the old state of the input um, and you can externally define this this function um, and it just needs to behave like a normal signature verifier um, And so this just defines uh, that function type. So it's a function from octs, which is going to be the actual data uh, as an explicit length uh, atom. And then uh, the signature parsed out into the RNS. Um, the way that these verifiers work is they produce, they, they, they generally produce an address um, and if you if, if, if the signature is wrong it doesn't usually like produce null it produces just a different address and so when we say verifier it's more like a recover it's, it's recovering an address and then you see if that's the one that you expected and if it's not then it failed so it produces a unit address the case where it would produce null is if your signature is uh, incorrectly formed uh, for example, the V argument should be between zero and three. If it's not, then um, uh, then you should produce null. All right. So those are all of our types. And so that brings us to the last two items here. I'm going to jump around the code a little bit. Um, We'll go down to our main function real quick, which is at the bottom. It takes in a few arguments, a uh, verifier, like we just described, it takes in the old state and the input, which we just looked at. It also takes in the chain ID. Um, this is the, uh, what is it, uh, EIP 151 chain ID. Essentially, the, the goal is to make sure that if you uh, sign a transaction meant for one 
for one fork of Ethereum, for for one new, uh, deployment of Ethereum, uh, that you can't run the same one, like use the same signature to run it on another one. Uh, so, for example, if you if you sign a set your transaction that's meant for the Robson testnet, then chain ID will be, I think three. I had to look it up. Um, and so that's not going to work if you run it on mainnet because mainnet is going to use a chain ID of one. Um, this is used uh, in, in part for to distinguish between uh, like testnet and mainnet transactions. Make sure you can't replay between them, but also uh, between forks of Ethereum. Um, so for example, Ethereum Classic uses a different chain ID. I forget what it is. I think it's 40 something. I don't remember though. Um, and so you, um, if it, and, and so if you were to sign a transaction meant for Ethereum Classic, it's not going to work here because it's different chain ID and vice versa. All right, so that's the input. The output is just effects, which is a list of diff. Maybe skip that type, but it's right here. It's just a list of diff um, and a new state. And then we, we just say, if it's a, if our input was a layer one transaction, we're gonna receive log, otherwise it's a uh, layer two transaction, and so we're gonna receive batch. We'll look at receive log first. So these are layer one transactions, which means that uh, they've been validated by Ethereum already, by, by the Solidity contracts. And we, And so we just need to uh, reflect what happened. We're not actually trying to validate anything in particular. And so we take in our old state, the event log, we produce effects, new state. We don't need the, the verifier here. There's no signature checking required. We don't need any chain ID because again, no signature checking required. Um, the way these logs are set out is, um, let me bring it up here. Um, is they have a series of topics. The first topic is the hash of the transfer, or sorry, of the like event name, um, which is going to be one of uh, one of these. These are all the different types of events we support. And so um, we alias that to log name, and then we're going to check for each of them. We first check for ones that uh, we're not going to do anything with. We want to have a concept of act activation here. We don't react to spawning directly. That'll send us um, there'll be an ownership change event that we will react to, but spawning we, we know up on as well. Um, ownership transferred here is not ownership of a ship. This is a, uh, a standard. So uh, Solidity contracts commonly are what they call ownable, which means they use the Open Zeppelin uh, contract for ha having an owner. Um, and Azimuth has that its owner is the ecliptic. So whenever the ecliptic upgrades, we'll get an ownership transfer to log saying that the upgrade happened. But we don't respond to that here. Um, and so we just know up. All right. Uh, then we go through the ones that we do respond to. So if, if the DNS changed, we want to parse that out. So we first say there should be no more topics. Um, there's always between one and four topics, and with DNS, there shouldn't be any. Um, the way that you can, okay, let's look real quick at um, uh, what these topics look like. So this is the solidity. All uh, oh, right, sorry, this would be in azimuth. Uh, so, for example, this one is an event change DNS has three strings. There's other ones like, um, yeah, like build continuity. 
uh, it has two arguments. One is the points of the ship name and the other is the continuity number. Um, we have a concept of indexed arguments. If they're indexed, that means they show up as a topic. You can have up to four of those, although one of them is the function name, so up to three, really. Um, and then you can have non-indexed ones. If they're not indexed, then they'll go in the data section. Um, index just means that the um, that Ethereum nodes will let you filter by them, basically. They'll add them to an index, and so they're somewhat more gas expensive. Um, so you only, only want to index stuff that makes sense to index. It does make sense to say, what are all the breaches for a particular point? So that one we index, but it doesn't, it's rarely going to be useful to say, okay, give me all of the times that someone did their third breach without specifying the ship. So we don't index on that. Um, so you can check these to, to understand where the, where the data is coming from. Um, but for now, you can, uh, you can just trust me when, when I say that these get parsed correctly. So change DNS doesn't have any indexed arguments. It just had, if you remember those three strings as, uh, data, this is actually relatively hard to parse out. This is, this is the hardest, uh, event to parse out because it has three variable length, um, arguments, uh, pretty much everything else is fixed length. And so, right, the way we parse these out, these are roughly, if I remember right, this is a pointer to the first string, pointer to the second string, pointer to the third string, length of the first string, first string, length of the second string, second string, length of the third string, third string. You count from the right because... Um, because that's kind of how you tend to parse atoms. Um, there's a whole complicated, like, uh, recursive way to parse these if you have long strings. What we do here is say, actually, we're going to hope that, like, we're, we're only going to support the case where the domain name is less than or equal to 32 bytes. So 32 characters. Um, this should basically always be true, um, and it lets us do. It lets us make this part much simpler, um, which I think is probably worth it. And I, the DNS stuff should be um, should be changed anyways. So this is a little bit of a of a deviation from from layer one, uh, just a slight restriction. But in practice, it's not going to matter. I don't think. Um, I, I, I skipped this line. So rip eight means, uh, divided into block sizes of eight, um, eight in this context. And we'll see this in, in others. This is block with a Q B L O Q is a, is a Hoon concept, uh, that refers to, um, how you'd like, yeah, count out steps, um, and the size that it refers to is two to the block size. So if the block size of eight means two to the eight, which is 128 bits, which is, wait, 256 bits, which is 32 bytes. Um, and so we're saying divide, like uh, rip this part into a, a list where each item is 32 bytes long. Um, and so that's where this list comes from. Then we say, okay, if it is this long, that means it wasn't longer than 32 bytes. And so we're going to go ahead and say, this is the first item, this is the second item, this is the third item. It's just referring to A, B, and C here. Um, and then uh, we're going to set that as our new DNS. So we're going to return a new state with that as, as the DNS. And we're also going to return as our list of effects something saying that the DNS changed to this. And then that's, yeah, that's pretty straightforward. That gives you the structure of how we react to layer one stuff. We'll go through the other ones faster. 
Um, so if we get an approval for all that, that means we added or removed an operator. There's a couple of indexed arguments, the owner and the operator. The data just has whether or not it's approved. Um, and we produce an effect saying what happened. We also modify our operators list to either add or remove that operator depending on whether the approval uh, flag was set or unset. All right, so much for the sort of miscellaneous ones. Um, the rest of these are all operating on a particular ship. And these are kind of the standard ones. Um, they're sufficiently standard that the first argument, the first indexed argument is always going to be a, a ship, and that ship is the one that is getting modified. So we fetch that out, and then we um, ass assert that that exists. We should take a look at get point get point um, checks in our state in point set state for that ship. If it exists, we return it. If it doesn't exist, we create it in general. Um, the only exception uh, it would be if it's if the ship name is too big, if it's a moon or a comet or, or bigger than that, then it will produce null. Um, but as long as it's a planet or something, then even if we've never seen this planet before, even if it's, even if it's never existed before, we're going to um, uh, we're going to uh, produce something. So this is actually how ships get get added to the map. Um, so we bunt point and then we give it its initial information. So initial information is that it's, it starts out with, with a sponsor and that sponsor is, um, sane, which is the prefix of the ship. So Mars odd sponsor is Zod. Um, it's a, it's, it's a suffix when you say it as, as a word like that, but it's a prefix, um, number wise. And then the other thing that we want to know, or that we want to check basically, or that we want to set is whether it's on layer one or layer two, or yeah, that, those are the only two options that it can be when it starts out. So galaxies are on layer one, um, stars and planets. Um, we check what its parent is, if its parent is on layer one, then the new one's on layer one. If its parent is on layer two, the new one's on layer two. If its parent is on layer one, it's set spawn proxy to layer two, then what it just created is on layer two. So much for get point. Um, we assert that it that this produced something because it uh, should only produce null if the ship name was longer than four bytes, which should never be happening. Um, a note on assertions, by the way, is versus no opping. Assertion means that we don't ex expect this to ever fail. If it does fail, then the function sort of can't proceed. And so, uh, it, it, you don't want to do that just because someone sent you garbage data. Anyone can send arbitrary batches, for example. And that that shouldn't cause an assertion failure. That should just cause a no-op. Um, if an assertion failure were to happen, this would be due to a bug. Um, and um, basically, the network would need to decide uh, how to get past it, how, how to insert, interpret this transaction. It means basically this transaction that was sent that we don't know how to interpret. And so we need to like come up with consensus as to how to interpret that, which generally it's going to be probably not too hard because it's probably something that, you know, on accident, 
makes the first topic not a ship or something, um, which I don't believe is possible right now, but I could imagine that getting introduced in a later upgrade and, and us not realizing that it's going to change that. And then we just need to be like, okay, we need to recognize what happened and come up with, with a fix and then you upgrade it, which isn't, which isn't too bad. Um, but that's, so basically you assert when it's something that you believe to always be true and if it's not true, then you don't want to just keep going, keep blindly going forward, right? If if we somehow parsed out a ship that's not like that's more than four bytes long, we don't want to keep going forward because something is broken, and so we want to stop and then have the network decide how to continue. And so that's what assertion, uh, asserting does. All right, um, this TISAP stuff says basically from here through the end, we're gonna produce, instead of, so what we were producing is a list of effects in a new state. Now we're actually just gonna produce a list of effects and a new point, because only one point can change and we know which point it is. We're gonna produce a unit of that because we, um, if, if, if this fails in a way that, that no ops, then we don't want to change the state at all. So if it produces null, then don't change the state, and don't give any effects. If it doesn't no op, then uh, produce the effects and uh, modify the state by putting into the um, into points that state at that ship the new point that was produced. So now for the rest of these, we can um, we can just produce the changes to the point. All right. So, if the, our spawn proxy changed, then um, if we're not in layer one, ignore it. Or rather, or yeah, if we're not in layer one, ignore it. Otherwise, um, see what it changed to. If it change the deposit address, which is that one we defined at the top, then that means we're actually depositing it. And so we just want to change the dominion. If it changed to anything else, then we change the spawn proxy. And so we produce the effect for that and we change the spawn proxy to that to address. Um, note that when, when we, if we are depositing, we don't change the to address because we actually leave it the same as it was in layer one. That one still has control. All right, um, escape accepted is the next log. So that's when an escape has finished on layer one. When that happens, we get who the parent was. Uh, we already know who the kid was because that's um, that was defined here as ship. Um, and we say, okay, let's go to the parent, see if that's on layer two. If the parent is on layer two, then, um, then the escape doesn't, isn't real because the, the, the escape log comes from layer one, can't apply if the parent is on layer two. So we, we know up there. Um, otherwise, we go ahead and um, set our escape to null and set our sponsor to the new parent. Uh, I missed, I think. No, yeah, that's it. Um, I'm not gonna keep saying each of the diffs that we produce, but you can see that we just produced a diff saying that we um, the, the state changed in this way. All right, then next log is lost sponsor. Um, that's if, so to lose a sponsor means to, um, uh, your sponsor detached from you before you uh, escaped anywhere else, and so now you don't have a sponsor at all. That looks very similar to escape accepted, except that 
we um, we have to check a couple different things. First, um, if the sponsor we lost was not our actual sponsor, we didn't actually lose anything. It's possible that lost sponsor happened on layer one because uh, but you've already on layer two switched a different sponsor. So we just know off in that case. Um, and then we uh, go ahead and, and implement it. Say that we don't have a sponsor anymore. All right, the rest of these um, can be done on any ship on layer one, even if the spawn proxy is set to layer two. Um, right, the issue with the earlier ones is that they, they may not be able to if your spawn proxy is already set, but anyways, so we, we checked that if it's not on layer 2, we just want to know op. Or, sorry, if it is on layer 2, then, then we want to know op um, because all of these shouldn't keep affecting it. We'll go quickly through these. If we requested an escape on layer 1, we put that in our state. If uh, escape was canceled on layer one, we put that in our state. If we broke continuity, so we did a continuity breach, then we put that in our state. If the keys changed, we parse those out using cut. So with the block size of eight, so we're taking 32 byte chunks again. Get the, the first 32 byte chunk, second, third, fourth, from the data, store that in our state. Um, if the owner changed, this looks similar to the change spawn proxy um, in that if the owner changed to the deposit address, then that means the dominion changed layer two instead of the ownership changing. And it's still owned by the same person who previously owned it on layer one. Uh, but if it's not to the deposit address, and that just means the owner of the ship actually did change. And so we reflect that. Transfer proxy can change, management proxy can change, voting proxy can change. If it's none of those, then uh, we didn't recognize the log, and that's not, well, right now we'd expect to recognize all the logs, but uh, if we don't recognize one, we just know up, which seems reasonable. And so that's the entirety of receive log, which is all of the layer one transactions. And so if we go back to main, then we see the other branch is we received a layer two batch. And this is the last portion. Um, receive batch, yeah. Let's take the same arguments as main. Um, we set the chain ID. We save the chain ID as uh, as ASCII because we end up needing that um, uh, on every batch. Or sorry, on every transaction. And so we just don't want to do it once. So we don't have to keep doing it. This just turns an atom into ASCII in uh, in the easy way. Just just go through, you know, dividing by. Uh, Digit by digit, right? So dividing by ten, and uh, adding zero to the, you know adding ASCII zero to the mod and ten. Anyways, uh, I guess we didn't really look at like we we called these, but we didn't actually look at these helper functions. Uh, ship rank is just saying is this a galaxy, star, planet, uh, moon, or comet, um, and then saying which is just uh, getting the, the prefix. So the default parent. Anyways, um, I'm going to parse rule. Let me see batch. We'll spend a little time on that. So these, this is how we parse a batch or a roll. Um, a loop. 
we're done, we so we we have an accumulator. We we parse them one at a time, pushing them on the front, reverse it to get us it back in the correct order. Um, each individual one, I'm going to call parse rot tx, which is either going to produce null, in which case we abort the whole batch, or uh, it'll produce a result, in which case we will save that and move on to the next. Um, the rule for batches and failure is if the batch doesn't parse, we fail the entire batch. The entire batch is a no-op. If it does parse, then each transaction fails or succeeds on its own. All right, so for parsing an individual transaction, we get the, the current remainder of the batch and then we either say pricing failed or here's the transaction and the remainder after we finished grabbing one. Because what most of this stuff is, is fixed with um, transactions in general and not because they have different uh, arguments. And so we grab them one at a time. And once we finish one, we know how much is there, we know what the remainder is to keep going on. Um, the details of how this parses are not super important, um, but are definitely worth uh, worth seeing down with and playing around with. Um, but I won't go into a lot of detail about how it's implemented. It's possible that we'll change how it's implemented. Um, Master Morizad has, has written a version of this that uses cursors that may be more efficient. Um, but Briefly, the main um, like the main idiom I use here is a function called take, which is um, defined in terms of some of those bit twiddling things, and it, so it takes a block size, or rather a step, which in this case is a block size, um, and Actually, yeah, it just, it, okay, it takes what they call a byte, um, which is either a block size or a block size and a number of blocks. So if it was this, that would mean take a byte. This means take 65 bytes. Um, three is, so a block size of three, two to the three is eight, that means eight bits. So byte, so take three is take a byte, take three 65 is take 65 bytes. And so it produces um, the atom that you just took and the remainder of the batch. Um, batches are the length that we've taken and then the remainder of the batch. So that's what gets updated. Anyways, the details don't matter a ton. Um, what matters is just to find all these takes uh, because that's how, how we parse things. So we first take 65 bytes for the signature. This is worth, uh, let's see, I have an example of this here. Um, which we'll go through in a minute. Um, maybe we should go through that first. Yeah, probably. Okay, so. A signed transaction starts with, I guess, first of all, when you're parsing out of atoms, you always parse from the from right to left. It's because, like, Arabic numerals are written uh, big endian, and um, parsing numbers is actually more naturally done little endian, because if you do big endian, you have to have a concept of uh, size at the beginning, you have to start by measuring it, which uh, we shouldn't really have to do. Um, if, you, if you're just using, uh, you know, big ints, which is what atoms are, then um, it's, it's simpler conceptually to start from the right, because you can just uh, divide and mod to get, to get what you need. Anyways, I, I'll, I'll leave the Little Indian uh, Maximalist rant for for later, um, but uh, we do everything little Indian. 
And so that means a signed transaction is, you know, starting from the right is a 65 byte signature, a perfectly Ethereum compatible signature. And then the uh, transaction itself, that transaction looks like this, starts with a with, with four bytes for the signer ship. So this, um, oops. Um, we're, we're parsing into a raw TX, right? So we get signature, we get uh, the signer ship, four bytes, one byte to represent the proxy, actually it's really only three bits and then five bits of padding um, to get the proxy, which is one of these. And then um, one byte for an opcode, which is going to refer to these, one of these 11. Um, it's actually, you know, seven bits, or well, there's 11 of them, so really only four bits um, for the opcode, and then a few bits of padding, and then a flag, possibly. We'll look at how that works. Um, anyway, so we have the opcode, and then we have arguments. Arguments are variable width, uh, depending what the opcode is. So, for example, many of them use uh, this pattern. Actually, not that many of them do. They used to. Uh, a lot of them use I, one or the other of these. Like the, these ones, for example, take a four byte ship name. The, these ones take a 20 byte address. Uh, configure keys is the big one. Uh, yeah, there. Um, that's going to take. 32 bytes for the encryption key, 32 bytes for the authentication key, uh, 32 bytes maybe for the crypto suite, I'm not sure how many, and then um, a flag for breaching. And that, that is everything that we parse out. We'll look at these, um, or we'll, we'll look at this, uh, and we look at verifying signatures. All right, so, Um, to try and understand this code, we start by taking 65 bytes for the signature. And then we do some fiddling. Um, where the goal is to, is to create this structure because basically we want to keep track of the remainder so that we can return that. We want to keep track of the raw bytes as well, that, that, that we keep as well as the um, the sort of parsed, like the actual structured data. The reason we need to keep the raw ones around is because we're later on gonna need to verify the signature. We can't verify the signature now, even though we have the signature, because verifying the signature depends on uh, whether that address owns this ship. And we don't know that during parse stage because an earlier transaction in this batch, in this role, could have changed who owns the ship, um, could have changed the nonce, could have changed any of that stuff. And so uh, we can't verify signatures right now. So we store the raw data so that we can do it later. Okay. Once we dealt with all that, we say, okay, now we just want to parse into the actual um, the actual transaction. And so we say, okay, take zero, so block size of zero, two to the zero is one. So that's one bit block size. So we're taking three bits for the for the from proxy. We um, make sure that it's actually a a uh, valid proxy, and then, um, and then interpret it as what it is. We take five bits of padding to get us back under the you know byte aligned. And we take four bytes. That's the ship name. So now we've parsed out the, f the whole from address, which is. Uh, from here on, 
And then we uh, now go through some shenanigans to produce the right thing. Um, but here we're, we're pressing on now skim TX. And so we start by taking the first seven bits, interpreting them as an opcode, and switching on that. So the opcodes, they're just labeled in order here. There's 11 of them, 0 through 10. And they get parsed uh, in the straightforward way. So transfer point has a flag. A couple of these have flags. We pack those actually into the previous byte. So this, that's why the opcode is only seven bits. We use the last bit for flags. We save a byte by doing that. Maybe it's not worth it, but it's fine. We just need a flag. So we take that. We um, also take the address. So that's 32, or that's um, 20 bytes. That's a way to read that. And then we uh, produce that as a skim TX, as well as the, uh, the modified batch. Um, an important point is that when we take flags, we interpret them here as Lubians. Um, so to emphasize that, we test it specifically against zero. So zero means true on reset. Um, and one means false. So be careful with that. Um, the spawn transaction, this one doesn't have a flag, and so we just take some padding and don't and don't ever use it. Um, take you know, one bit of padding to get us back byte aligned, and then we say, okay, for spawn, I need, I need to know a ship and, a, and an address, which is what, like, this one, I guess. That one works for spawn. Um, so I'll parse those out, move on. Configure keys, same thing. Uh, the, the breach is a flag, so we take that first, and then we say 32 bytes for this, 32 bytes for that. Uh, I guess four bytes of the crypto suite. So if we have to change cryptography algorithms more than four billion times, we'll be in trouble. Um, produce that. These ones all follow uh, two patterns. They either are take escape or take ship address. Take escape is just uh, a bit of padding and a ship name. Uh, ship address is um, just a bit of padding and then an address. It's actually, uh, it used to be that it needed to take both a ship and an address, but now it just takes an address. So I'm going to do that, which means I think I can get this in 80 columns now. Nice. Um, yeah, much better. Take is, escape is also actually more clearly written now. It's just take ship. tests, it'll be fine. And that's all the, pro that's all the parsing. The, the, the most complicated part is, is this sequence, which I'll let you work through on your own. Um, yeah, so there's all the parsing. Okay, then going back to receive, so we were at the main function receive batch, we parse the role. Now we have this list of uh, raw TXs, and we want to go through them. If we got to the end of the list, we're done, should produce our state. Otherwise, we want to verify the signature. We pass it to uh, the top of the role and our other uh, state. There are other arguments. Uh, so let's look at this.
All right. We're just going to produce a, a Lubian. Get the point. We never parse more than four bytes, so hopefully we have an actual point. Um, proxy from point is just says, yeah, whatever our, our proxy was, get the um, get the address and nonce that we expect for it. If it was a manager proxy, get the manager from proxy dot own, which is um, which is this, right? So it, it's always just going to produce an address and a nonce. So that's the address and nonce that we expect. Um, and then now what we're going to do is we're going to construct the text that we expect it to be signed and then run the verifier against it. So um, we don't have them sign just what's in the, the transaction because um, if you noticed it, for example, well, it had a from address, it didn't have a nonce in it. Um, and it's also uh, the other two issues that it has is that it doesn't have the chain ID. So if you signed a transaction on say Robston, you would, it would also like someone could replay that on mainnet. Uh, so you don't want to do that. Um, and then the other, the other issue with it is that, um, uh, so you can look into EIP 191 for more background on this, but basically, uh, you don't want, so there, there's a standard prefix that Ethereum wallets tend to add to signatures. Um, and the reason they do that is so that they can know for themselves that they're not signing an Ethereum transaction because they want to display to their users, especially for like hard wallets, um, but even for like MetaMask and stuff, um, they, they want to explain to uh, display to their users, um, you know, that I'm signing a message and not signing an Ethereum transaction. And so uh, they will add this prefix, the standard prefix, um, which is, yeah, 19 followed by, like the byte 19 followed by Ethereum signed message, new line, um, the ASCII decimal, ASCII decimal encoding of the length of the rest of it, which is kind of annoying. It'd be nice if it wasn't ASCII, but whatever. Um, and then um, we add our own unique um, prefix there so that you can't replay across apps, basically. Um, if, if you signed something with your key for some other app um, that happened to be a valid Urban ID transaction, which is relatively unlikely, but definitely not impossible, um, then we don't want that to be able to uh, just get replayed by an attacker not even replayed, but just like played by an attacker on, um, uh, like on here. And so we add a unique thing that is, you know, presumably no other project is going to include in their signatures. We also include the chain ID as we described, um, ASCII encoded, and then colon the nonce not ASCII encoded, just as the raw knots itself. It gets four bytes, which means knots is can only be four bytes, which means um, if you use more than four billion transactions, then you're going to be in trouble. So don't do that. You should never be needing more than four billion transactions. Um, and if we ever decide, like, get close to that for whatever reason, then we'll upgrade. Um, and then the transaction itself. Um, the all of this we can keep out of the transaction that goes on chain, which saves us a lot of gas. Saves probably almost half the gas, something like that. Um, 
because we can infer them. Most of these are obvious how we can infer them, but the uh, nonce is a little bit not obvious. Instead of requiring them to specify the nonce that they signed it with, um, we know what nonce it should be. And so we just add it ourselves. So it doesn't go in the transaction itself. All right. This gets us all the way up to uh, to here. This is all that is, is the prepared data. Um, prepared data is what you would want to sign with an Ethereum wallet, which is going to add this standard prefix. Um, so sign data is uh, is going to be similar, and it's just going to. Um, it's, it's just going to add that, that prefix. This is UD to, to ask you that we saw before. And that's pretty much it. Um, CAD takes a block size and then explicitly length stuff and concatenates them respecting that length. Um, so it's safe to use in the presence of leading zeros. So the way to read this, for example, is 14 bytes of this followed by Met three chain T, which is just going to be the length of the chain ID. Um, that many bytes of chain T, one byte of colon, four bytes of the nonce, and then the raw transaction, which has its um, its octs, so it has uh, has its own length built in, and then we're done. This is the same thing. Twenty six bytes for that prefix. And then um, this is the length of the length. And this is the actual length in Kodos ASCII. Anyways, fairly straightforward. All right. Um, one more note on the signature type. Personal sign is the name of the signature that has this in the prefix. Um, the other versions that tend to be supported are eth sign, which is not supported on everything, but it is on some that does not use the prefix. Um, if your wallet only supports eth sign, you can just add the prefix manually, no problem. Um, there's also something called sign typed data, which is nice because it um, would display it in your in your wallet uh, in a more legible way. Unfortunately, first of all, it's not supported by everything. There are some wallets, um, I think even one of the big hardware wallets doesn't quite support it, right? Um, I'm sure it will soon, but I'd be worried about relying on that. Um, and also, it's a complicated um, serialization format that I'd rather not have to deal with. I like that the parsing here is not very recursive, is not very, um, there's just nothing complex to it. And so adding this, uh, yeah, the, this complicated structure is not, is probably not worth it. Okay. Then, so now we know what we expect to be signed. We run verify sig with the actual signature and what we expect to be signed. This is gonna produce a unit address we're, then we just check whether that address matches what um, what we need it to be. Um, right, and the the way we know that nonce matched is that it was here, so it's it's part of the signature or part of the signed data. So that verifies both of the things in the need. A verify signature just takes a byte for the the V part of the um, of the signature, which is how it disambiguates which of the different points on the curve that it could be. There's uh, up to four points that are specified. Uh, just look into CDSA signatures if you want to learn more about how that works. Um, S and R are then the two uh, the two coordinates we need. 
Um, the one detail here is that the there's four different items that can be. Sometimes it's written as zero through three, and sometimes it's written as twenty-seven through thirty. Um, you can look up the details. It's someone decided it'd be nice to add twenty-seven to it to keep them distinct from other signatures. But it's that was a bad idea because now half of wallets produce one, half of them they produce the other. Ledger produces them with zero through three. MetaMask produces twenty-seven through thirty. My crypto, my Ether wallet produces twenty-seven through thirty. It's it's a mess. Um, so we just support both by saying if V is greater than twenty-seven or greater than or equal to twenty-seven, then we subtract twenty-seven. So uh, what we pass in the verifier has a V between zero and three. Inclusive. And that's it. That that so so verifier then produces the address that it recovered. We check and make sure that that so it either didn't produce didn't recover any address, in which case the signature failed, or it did. And then if it if it did, that needs to be equal to the address we expected. So that gives us our Lubian as to whether or not the signature passed. And so we can go back to. Um, receive batch. So if you remember, we parsed the role. Now we're looping through the role. So we verify the signature. If the signature fails, then we move on to the next item in the role. Um, and we produce an effect saying that the signature failed. We don't do anything else besides that. Um, Right, we, we don't even increment the nonce, we don't do anything because signature failed. Um, but we do move on to the next item in the role. We don't fail the whole batch. If the signature succeeded, then even if the transaction is later going to fail, we want to increment the nonce because uh, we don't want people to be able to replay this uh, in the future. And so we increment nonce, which is just we say, who's it from? And that, you know, whatever the proxy that it's from, we increment the nonce in that proxy. Not very complicated. And then we deal with the actual transaction. We run receive TX, which we'll look at in a moment. That produces a list of effects in a new state. Well, I, I, I unit that because either the transaction failed, in which case we report that, and no op to, like, don't change the state or the transaction succeeded, in which case we report that, as well as any effects from it, and the new state. Then we uh, recurse to the next item in the role, and um, then produce, uh, produce the moves coming out of that, or moves the effects. Okay, then receive TX is the last part of this. So this is, we're receiving an individual layer two transaction. In the state, we have a transaction. And uh, so we handle the 11 different kinds of transactions. Um, most of them use either with point or with point escape uh, as helper functions. We'll look at process spawn first, which does not. So process spawn just gets called with the ship and the to address, which is the arguments that spawn had. Um, and we say, OK, what's the parent? We need to um, check then that the parent is the ship that this is from, you know, the, 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 the signer. This, yeah, the signer needs to be the parent if we're going to spawn a ship. Um, we also need to make sure that the, that we're able to spawn on layer 2. So either, either the parent is on layer 2 or its spawn proxy is on layer 2. Also need to check that it's either the owner or the spawn proxy that, um, that signed it. Now we checked all the permissions. Now we make sure that they haven't already spawned it. 
sure that we're spawning something one level down, right? A star is spawning a planet, for example. And then um, we do the actual spawning. There's two kinds of spawning, just like in layer one. If you're spawning to yourself, then, um, then you do it directly. So you create the new point and then um, set its uh, set its owner to the to address. If it's not to ourself, then we go ahead and set the owner to the owner of the parent, and then set the transfer proxy to the to address. So this does the type of transaction or the type of transfer that you have to accept. Um, we do this for for safety, basically. Um, it would be nice for gas purposes not not have to accept it potentially, but uh, it proves that the rec receiver actually has control of that address. Um, I think this is maybe a place that should be you know that should be changed. Maybe there should be a flag or something or another function that lets you spawn without re requiring it be accepted. You know, sort of direct spawn, but. Um, that would be a semantic change, and, and again, we should be conservative about semantic changes while we're while we're changing the form uh, to layer two, and we can consider that you know that sort of improvement at a layer, later date. And the update points that state with what we what we did, and we're done. So that's how spawn works. The other ones uh, with point or with point escape, which are very similar. Um, Basically, it lets us. Uh, like each transaction can only affect one point, and it's and so we specify which point that is, um, and we pull it out. We take a look at it. We make sure that it's on layer two. The only difference is that the escaping ones don't have to be on layer two necessarily, but the the other ones you do, and then. Um, we call the, the function that's supplied, and if it didn't produce null, we produce the effects and update the point for that. Uh, I guess the spawn, the spawn is, is similar, it just then requires it to be on layer one, I guess. Sorry. It requires it to not be on layer one, so it's either the dominion is spawn or the dominion is L two. Um, right, but but each of these take a function that's the sort of actual function, um, which is going to be this list. Process transfer point does what you'd expect. It's it's probably the most complicated one. Um, so we're transferring a point. We make sure that we're either the owner of the transfer proxy. We do the actual transfer, which is set our address, set the owner address to the to address, set the transfer proxy to null. Um, we always set the transfer proxy to null because that's what layer one does. Layer one does, that's part of the EXE 721 um, uh, standard is that it has to be set to null. Uh, here on layer two, we don't need to follow that standard, but uh, we do it because that's what layer one does. And then we have uh, the idea that reset can be can be true or false. If reset is false, then we're done. We should produce it. If reset is true, then we're going to go through and update various things. If we've ever set the keys, then we increment the keys, set them to zero. If we've ever set the keys, then we also are going to breach. And then we're also going to go ahead and uh, set all of our proxies to to null. And then produce all the effects come out of that, and we're done. So that's process transfer point. Process configure keys is easier. Make sure we're the owner or owner of the management proxy. And then um, similar to above. If we if we are breaching, then breach. So change rift at that point. Now you can increment the rift. 
producing effect about it. Um, if we're in fact changing our keys, so if you supply the same thing, then it won't it won't in increment the nonce, but or not the nonce, the, the life. Um, but if you are in fact changing your keys, then we'll increment the life and set the keys to the new one. Um, so this is how you can get a rift that's ahead, right, that's higher than your life number, is if you run process, if you run configure keys with a uh, with the same keys you already have set, but with breach, that's true. All right, we need the home stretch. Escaping. Make sure there's a manager proxy. Make sure we're escaping to someone who's one level up, right? A planet can only escape to a star, a star can only escape to a galaxy. And then set escape, cancel escape, so unset escape. Adopt is uh, the unset escape and set the sponsor. Reject, unset escape, detach. Um, unset having a sponsor and then uh, set management proxy set spawn proxy set transfer proxy do exactly what you'd expect um, spawn proxy uh, you can only set a spawn proxy for a um, galaxy or a star because planets can't well planets can spawn moons but they don't uh, that doesn't happen on chain that's all off chain And that's it. Took, this took a little longer than I expected, but that is the entirety of, uh, you know, if you understand knock and you understand the code that we just looked at, then you understand to, you know, like completely precisely the semantics of, of layer two, um, of, of these naive rollups. So, hopefully, that is uh, helpful for anyone who's either building on this or uh, trying to decide how to, how to vote on this or um, just wants to understand how this how this stuff works. Um, if you have concerns or questions, definitely let us know. Um, the best place to voice them is probably the Forge group, um, but you can also DM me I'm with Dev Wisray, which is uh, spelled like that, Dev Wisray, um, or any other way that you can get a hold of me. I'm Philip Monk, PC Monk. Um, and, uh, yeah, you can find this code, uh, in the Philip slash naive branch of Urbit Urbit. Uh, there's a bunch of other code that kind of comes along with this, um, to define like the aggregator that's creating these batches and to, uh, you know, to, to run this code, um, you know, to listen to Ethereum, to talk to an Ethereum node, to get the events out, to get the batches and, and pass them into this. Um, but all of that is just, uh, it's just code that can be updated easily anytime. This is the part that we have to have consensus about um, so that everyone has the same, the same view of our ID. Everyone comes up with exactly the same state. So, um, yeah, I hope that was useful and I'll go ahead and sign off.